thanks for the invitation. So it's really a pleasure to join this science communication series of ISAF Kolkata. Uh, and uh, I'll be happy to present on, on uh, our actually uh, the journey with the hepatitis C virus. Particularly this year is very relevant uh, because the, the Nobel Prize for the Physiology and Medicine has been awarded uh, to the group of scientists who actually are the champion and the pioneer behind this whole hepatitis C virus uh, discovery and uh, you know the, the, its impact on the global health and the development of the therapeutic approaches. So uh, before I start, you know, I'm at currently at the National Institute of Biomedical Genomics. We joined here in 2018. Before that, uh, I've been working on um, hepatitis C virus for last 22 years in the Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. My lab is still continuing there and they are actually contributing to the field of hepatitis. Now, <clears throat> just to start with, as uh, we wanted to have it, uh, very basic thing. I was just looking at the historical perspective. I mean, what we know about hepatitis. Now, if you really look at the literature, this is uh, almost like a 3000 BC Sumerians. They used to think that the liver is the home of the soul and the jaundice is the attack on the liver by a devil named Azau. Then 400 BC Hippocrates, Hippocrates actually said that the bile contained in the liver is full of flame and blood and erupts. After such an eruption, the patient soon rapes, becomes angry and talks nonsense. Then there is a mention in 17th to 19th century where the jaundice epidemic uh, was actually noticed in the military, in the main and the civilians. And in the French camp, because of the yellowing of the camps or the battlefields, uh, they used to call it as a John D. D. K. Champ or the battlefield jaundice. And the clinical term was icteras. Icteras is the yellowish or the discoloration of the skin due to hyperbilirubinemia. And actually, funny thing is, at that time, the myth was that the icteras is actually icteras galbula is actually a Baltimore Oriole, which is a, a yellow bird. And the myth was at that time that if you develop this kind of a yellowish in the skin, you go to the forest, sighting the bird was supposed to cure a person with jaundice. So while these things were going on 17th to 19th century, there was an accidental discovery of the Australian antigen by Dr. Bombard. Uh, and uh, he ended up discovering the, actually, he was trying to study the genetics of the disease susceptibility and ended up with a strange antigen, which they named it as an Australian antigen. And that was the discovery of the first hepatitis antigen. Now, hepatitis, as you know, can be actually of, uh, you know, triggered by different things. Like it could be because of the alcohol induced, it could be an autoimmune disease, disorders, non-alcoholic steatohepatitis. Many a times it is due to the toxins or other infections. But I mean, what we were actually more concerned now is the viral hepatitis and which is actually coined by a several alphabets, A, B, C, D, E, F. There is no F, but there is a G. So the F, hepatitis F could not sustain. I say it, hepatitis F failed. That's why now we jump to hepatitis G V virus. So as you see here, all these alphabets, A, B, C, D, E, and G, they are actually all causes viral hepatitis, except hepatitis B and hepatitis D, they are, are RNA viruses. Hepatitis B is partially double-stranded DNA and hepatitis D is also uh, a single-stranded RNA viruses, but it needs a satellite viruses like hepatitis B to carry on the infection. Now, you know, as you see here, hepatitis B was a major problem, 240 million chronic infections globally. And hepatitis C is also uh, following the hepatitis B, 150 million chronic infections globally was actually being noticed. Now, as early as in 1989, hepatitis C is known to, uh, you know, it was known to cause chronic hepatitis 
liver cirrhosis that leads to hepatocellular carcinoma. And there is some estimate in 2007, which shows that it actually suppresses the HIV infection uh, it, to some extent. And, you know, uh, uh, so HIV was actually 12,734, where hepatitis C was 15,106. So it's a major concern. Now, most of the time, the hepatitis C virus infection causes uh, the chronic hepatitis. But as you see here, 15 uh, to 25 percent people are lucky and they can actually clear the virus. But the 75 to 85 percent which actually develops the chronic hepatitis can lead to of that 20 to 30 percent into a cirrhotic liver and 2 to 7 percent of that can actually end up with the hepatocellular carcinoma, which is actually an end stage liver disease. How people get hepatitis is actually uh, most of the time it was because of the injecting of illicit drugs, high risk behavior in the past, sexual activities, and sometimes there are actually blood transfusion, uh, particularly because of the hemodialysis uh, and the healthcare employment people also used to get it. And before 2000, a lot of people got it in India because it was not mandatory for the blood donors to check for hepatitis C. So it was actually in our population. And as you see, hepatitis C virus, it, this is a 2013 picture. It's almost like an all over the world. And in some of the pockets, there are actually huge incidents of hepatitis. And there are several genotypes. There are seven genotypes so far. And there are 62 subtypes. And it's still emerging. And they keep on mutating. It's a major problem. Now, the thing that we are going to discuss it is these three persons, the Harvey, Alter, Michael Houghton, and Charles Rice. These three people were actually saved the whole world from this menace of hepatitis C virus. How their discovery led to the treatment is actually I'm going to highlight in my talk. So let's start uh, with the Harvey Alter's contribution. So as I told you that hepatitis B was actually discovered, Bloomberg was actually given Nobel Prize uh, in 76, I think if I'm not wrong. And, and, and then, uh, but there was still the problem persisted. Means there were actually incidents of blood transfusion after even screening of hepatitis B. So people were actually terming, uh, termed as, this is a non-A, non-B, viral hepatitis or NANBH. Now, uh, this, this virus is actually was causing a major concern. And Harvey Alter's group, actually, uh, it was a landmark paper in the Lancet in 78, where they have shown that if you actually take this serum from an infected person, which is actually non-A, non-B hepatitis, and inject it into chimpanzee, you can see a similar kind of a hepatitis developed in chimpanzee. So as you see here, uninfected and infected chimpanzee, chronic infection was more frequent compared to the hepatitis B infection. And uh, it was, as I told you, it was named as a non-A, non-B viral hepatitis. Serum from patients with acute or chronic non-A, non-B hepatitis could transmit the disease to chimpanzee. And uh, they also actually pointed out the virus is somehow coated with the liver droplets. The virus contains lipid. And the size was actually ranging around 30 to 60 nanometer. This was actually the first report on the presence of this uh, non-A, non-B hepatitis. And then Michael Houghton actually continued research and tried to identify what is this non-A, non-B uh, hepatitis causing agent? So what they did is essentially they collected the plasma from the infected chimpanzee, spun it in the ultracentrifuge, pelleted it, and then isolated the DNA and RNA from there. And, and that DNA and RNA, they did actually a shotgun and then expressed in a Lambda GT11 cDNA library. They made a cDNA library uh, of Lambda GT11. And then they actually probed it with the antibodies that were isolated from this non-A, non-B hepatitis patient. 
And then they actually screened for the clones, which are actually expressing the proteins that can be neutralized by the antibody or lighted up with the antibody that is collected from the patient. And they were successfully able to isolate, determine the properties of a clone. They named it as 511. This they found that this is an extra chromosomal derived from the RNA found only in the non-A, non-B hepatitis samples and distantly related to flavivirus encodes a protein that binds to the antibodies found only in the non-A, non-B infections. And as you see here in the Western, they actually clearly showed that it's actually specific for the antibody isolated from the non-A, non-B hepatitis, but it's not lighting up with the hepatitis B or hepatitis A. So this is essentially, again, another landmark study by Chu et al. from the group of Michael Houghton, which came out in science in 1989. Now that's 1989, and then Charlie Rice took it over, and then he tried to identify is it possible that you know you can characterize this hepatitis C virus? So that's the time they started calling it as a C because we already have hepatitis B, we have hepatitis A. Now they named it as hepatitis C. Now the question is whether the hepatitis C alone can cause the hepatitis or not. So Charlie's group showed, which was actually published in Science in 1997, that if you can isolate and clone the virus from an infected patient. And they showed that if you have this RNA and tagged it with a uh, conserved three prime end, non-coding regions at the three prime end, that engineered RNA when uh, they are actually try to incorporate some mutations which will inactivate it, or you use the white type and try to do this experiment in chimpanzee. And they could show that actually they are able to cause the infection. So that was the first incidence of a clone of hepatitis C genome. And people, uh, uh, their group has demonstrated that you can make the infectious RNA from the clone. And that infectious RNA itself can cause the disease. So if you can inject this to chimpanzee, it can express the viral protein, replicates, and then he has actually recapitulated this whole thing in a cell culture model. This is very important, as you know, that after the discovery of the virus, it's very important whether you can have a cell culture so that you can continue to understand the biology of the virus. So actually, Charlie Rice's uh, results opened up a huge window to work on this virus, to look at the biology of the virus, to understand the mechanism of pathogenesis of the virus, which was not possible earlier. And this is this was done in 1997. So essentially, how this discovery, so you can see the roadmap. The first, there was an actually a, a report on an observation of a non-A, non-B hepatitis virus uh, in the blood transfusion patients. So when this was actually taken it up and then infected in chimpanzee, it was found to come up with the similar kind of a disease. Then this was actually, this plasma was uh, then probed for the DNA and RNA, and that genetic fragments was actually cloned, and then it was actually uh, probed by the antibodies infected uh, with the, from the isolated from an infected patient, and finally the genome was identified. And Charlie Rice showed that you can actually have a cDNA or by reverse genetics, and that infectious cDNA you can make the RNA in vitro. And that RNA can actually cause the same hepatitis C disease in a cell culture and a chimpanzee model. So this was the discovery. And what this discovery led is essentially now you have a handle to detect the virus. Remember, this was 1997. And from 2000, it was so popular for detecting the hepatitis C virus because previously it was not very popular test to find out hepatitis C in the, as I told you, in the blood donors or in any other blood transfusion cases. So it became a normal practice for the people to test for hepatitis C virus. And that actually led the research to the eliminations of the risk of transfusion associated hepatitis. And that led to the research 
to identify and discover antiviral drugs. As you know, now there are several hepatite, anti-hepatitis C drugs are available over the counter to, to actually uh, combat this particular disease. So this disease can now be cured and raises potential for the global eradication of hepatitis C virus. Actually, incidentally, uh, in, in the last meeting when we attended hepatitis C, we used to have a big meeting and Charlie Rice actually declared it a couple of years back that we hope that after 2020, we don't need to have a hepatitis C virus meeting anymore because, you know, majority of these things are now under control. While saying so, we also uh, appreciate that there are a lot of things are still not known uh, and I'm going to highlight that part. Now, I'll try to uh, give you a little glimpse of research that our lab have been doing it. Uh, you know, uh, this was discovered in 1989 and I, I think joined the lab in UCLA uh, in, in 1991. And from then, uh, I have been working on hepatitis C virus. So from the beginning, our, my particular journey of research started almost uh, at the same time when the hepatitis C virus research was evolving. So I'll just give you some glimpse of results that we have actually generated in the laboratory at Indian Institute of Science. Now, hepatitis C virus, as I told you, now we know a lot about it. It's an RNA virus. It actually goes inside the cells and then uncoat the viral RNA makes viral proteins. And that's actually called translation of the viral protein. And then these viral proteins binds to the viral 5' UTR and the 3' UTR. And then it's in a membranous wave structure. They uh, make a replication. First, from the positive strand, there is made a negative strand. And that negative strand is actually used more and more as a template for more and more positive strand, which is ultimately packaged. We call virion assembly. And then the virus is released out of the system and then it actually infects the other neighboring cells. Now, what is interesting about is that hepatitis C or any for it that matter are actually restricted to liver. That's why we call hepatitis, hepatic cell. They actually target the hepatic cells. And for hepatitis C, it is even more specific that it infects only the hepatocytes, but it doesn't really affect that much of the stellate cells or the poopar cells, uh, which are neighboring cells. So it is something you can imagine that very specific for the entry. That means somebody is trying to get inside the room and, you know, once they get into the room, they know exactly where to go. They ended up into a kitchen, which you can take it as a hepatocytes within the big house of liver. And why in the kitchen? Because you have the utensils that are required to make good food so that the virus can actually survive inside this liver. And that food is really palatable. And as you see that this sub sandwich are actually cut down by knife and there are cellular protease and the viral protease actually chops this viral polyprotein into structural and non-structural protein. There are several structural protein like the core envelope P7 is an ion channel protein and the NS, and there are non-structural protein like the NS2, NS3, NS4A, NS4B, NS5A and 5B. NS5B is the RNA dependent RNA polymerase and NS3 protease is the protease which actually cleaves the viral polyprotein into small, small pieces of structural and non-structural protein. Now, arguably, people will always try to inhibit the viral protease or the RNA-dependent RNA polymerase so that they can inhibit the viral replication. And that's where it is done. As you know, initially, hepatitis C virus was actually treated with pegylated interferon and ribavirin, which is a nucleoside analog. But later on, as I told you, with the discovery of the cell culture and the advent of the uh, progress of the research, people started screening for different compounds and now there are telaprevir, and which actually inhibits NS3 protease, and sophosprovir, which actually inhibits NS5B polymerase, and the NS5A is actually targeted by Ladipass V. So these are the compounds which are now turned into a drug, and that, that can actually eliminate or bring down drastically the virus titer in an infected patient. So that is the good sign 
but you know as for everything there is always uh, limitations in the drugs because you know I, as i told you that hepatitis c has seven uh, genotypes and several subtypes so the genotype specificity is an issue emergence of drug resistance is another issue of the mutants relapse of once the drug is stopped there are several cases now coming up that even after the virus started is down after 6 to uh, 12 months the people is coming back with the hepatocellular carcinoma or actually there is a relapse of the disease so additional therapy associated side effects are also there so there is a scope to actually contribute to research to find out alternative drugs now i'll just give you just a, a short glimpse of what we are doing in our laboratory at the indian institute of science bangalore now when we actually started my laboratory at nine, in 1998 in hepat uh, in indian institute of science at the same time there was a paper in science which showed that actually in the ribosome that usually the cellular rna binds to the b sites and the a sites but hepatitis c interestingly binds to the exit gate of the ribosome so if you really look at this is the head this is the platform this is the pit this is the exit gate where there is a pink place with there is a protein called ribosomal protein s5 we showed that actually this protein interacts with the viral rna and the virus gets entry into the ribosome triggers a conformational alteration and access to the a sites and p sites to generate their protein synthesis so it is definitely an unique mechanism of viral rna translation although it's an eukaryotic rna you can still see there is a differences with the eukaryotic rna translation and this viral rna translation so and as we mentioned that there is a ribosomal protein s5 which is involved for the viral rna interaction but this procedure it's unique and fundamentally different and it involves a lot of host factor not only the viral protein there are some viral proteins involved but there are some host proteins involved so my lab was actually interested to find out which all ribosomal proteins involved for the interaction with the viral rna for the entry which all host factors are involved in the translation and replication of the virus and which all viral proteins are actually necessary to regulate the translation and the replication of the virus ultimately is it possible knowing this biology and the mechanism can we target to design a selective antiviral remember as i told you that the translation is a uh, unique and fundamentally different so if you can really target it we don't expect any side effects like an nst protease and ns5b when you actually inhibit you ended up actually inhibiting a lot of other cellular protease and uh, polymerases so this kind of effect we can actually avoid if we have a very specific targets but while understanding this biology over the years we have been actually studying that several host factors and interestingly some of these host factors are nuclear protein they have nuclear function but in the infected cells they come out from the nucleus to the cytoplasm bind to the 5 prime utr and in the 5 prime utr also the translation is something different the ribosome binds to an internal sequence closure to the initiator AUG, which we call internal ribosome entry site. So unlike cellular RNA, where there is a cap structure at the 5' end, ribosome binds to the cap structure. In this case, hepatitis C, ribosome 40S subunit can directly go and bind to the viral RNA near the initiator AUG. And this is actually facilitated by several transacting factors or host factors like LA and PTB. We showed that some of this protein also binds to the 3' UTR and causes a switch from the translation to replication. And not only that, there are now micro RNA like MIR122. We also showed MIR125B. They are regulating the abundances of the, their targets and those proteins, RNA binding proteins, and their affinity towards binding to the 5' UTR and 3' UTR. Now it is actually looks like a big concert where there are several players and latest players uh, along with the hur ptb and la protein that we have been working we found there are micro rnas and there are long non-coding rnas which are actually contributing to the hcv orchestra in the infected cells 
And over the years, we have shown how HCV infection, there are several proteins and the host factors, viral proteins and host factors are involved. The microRNA and the LNC RNA that are involved, as I told you, LA, PTB, HUR, or the MIR-122, 125B. And uh, uh, very recently, we showed uh, uh, the HALK, which is a, a liver-specific uh, long non-coding RNA and highly upregulated in the liver cancer. And actually we showed that how it actually helps in the virus to uh, increase the lipid droplets and package it along with it and use the VLDL pathway to excrete out and then uh, affect the neighboring cells. But now what is unsolved mystery is the hepatocellular carcinoma. And we are actually trying to understand how P53 and other players are actually contributing to the hepatitis C virus induced hepatocellular carcinoma. So we started with a simple observation with the translation that we call protein synthesis and tried to make it translational. How did we do it? We showed there is a small RNA which can prevent the ribosomal RNA, uh, I mean, sorry, hepatitis C RNA and the ribosome interaction. We showed the, if you just take a peptide corresponding to the RNA binding motif of the LA protein. And this 7 mar peptide, which actually forms a beta hairpin structure, is good enough if you just tag it with the six arginine residues. It goes inside the cells and can stop the virus RNA replication. We also showed that NS3 protease can also bind to the viral RNA for a switch from transition to replication. If you use a peptide corresponding to the RNA binding motif, it can prevent the viral RNA translation. Along with that, because of the uh, suggestions from the government of India, we were also trying to see some compounds from uh, pomegranate and also phylanthasamur as natural sources. And we have identified the pure compound from the natural sources. They can inhibit the hepatitis C virus replication to the extent that we are actually getting from the commercial drugs. And we are trying, we also found some monoclonal antibodies in collaborations with Professor Anjali Karande's lab and Dr. Soma Das, and we showed that these monoclonal antibodies can efficiently prevent the virus entry. And very recently, we have made, made a virus-like particle with the hepatitis C virus structural protein and showed that how that DLP can be used as a vaccine candidate. Now, all these things, we are testing it. As I told you, that hepatitis C virus doesn't have any uh, animal model. It infects the chimpanzee, but that chimpanzee work is now discouraged and it doesn't infect mouse. But we have collaborations with Japan with some uh, laboratory where we have mouse with a harboring human hepatocytes. And this mouse can be infected with the viruses. In this system, actually, we tested all our antiviral compounds and see whether we can get uh, reasonable results in an in vivo model. So what still remains is an appropriate model. As I told you, chimpanzee uh, work is now discouraged. Mouse model, we are using humanized mice, as I told you, and some researchers are trying ectopic liver generation to understand the virus biology in an in vivo system. Vaccines need different types, but there are limitations because of this viral sequences, uh, in, uh, genetic variations because of the error prone replication by the uh, that RNA dependent RNA polymerase, which is called the NS5B. Extensive glycosylations of the viral envelope protein also keeps changing its immunogenicity. And the major hurdle is the limited production of the whole inactivated virus. We still can't make tons of viruses as we do for other viruses. For some reason, there is a, a, a roadblock in that area. And the major thing that is actually being addressed is the progression to the hepatocellular carcinoma. You know, the, many a times the, after the viral infection, several pathways are activated. Unless those pathways are restricted, just bringing down the virus titer does not really prevent the disease progression. So we are actually trying to find out how we can prevent the disease progression. The patient who are curing of the virus should not develop hepatocellular carcinoma. That's a big challenge ahead of time. And the epigenetic modulations of the proteins and the nucleic acids and trying to see how they can actually contribute to the hepatocellular uh, progression 
it's possible that during viral infection this epigenetic changes happens unless we identify that which epigenetic changes are actually contributing to the disease progression it is difficult to really uh, uh, take care of this hepatocellular carcinoma disease and triggered the secreted molecules like, such as that exosome its combination and compositions finally the last words uh, that i got it from a uh, message none other than charlie rice he is also uh, saying that let's hope that this uh, that their effort and you know he is appreciating that all over the world there are several hcv researchers are actually contributed to this uh, final outcome that we could actually handle this disease efficiently but let's hope that this example of the benefit that science can bring will encourage the public to embrace and support fundamental and curiosity driven research this is the key word the curiosity driven research is something which all of us are actually encouraging and as we are in the midst of the experiencing with the ongoing pandemic there are many challenges ahead and this is one such example we should not be scared scared away from the menace of rna viruses this is one example that it was discovered in 89 and now in uh, 2020 2020 actually we could actually think of eradication of the disease so i'm sure many of this rna viruses we can actually handle taking this as an example so with this i would like to thank the you know the people who are working uh, these are the my present group uh, these people are actually at nibmg they recently uh, started working here at nibmg and these are the people who are working in my laboratory at the indian institute of science this research our research is heavily funded by the department of biotechnology dbt we have a center of excellence for hepatitis c virus research which went on for 10 years and of course the support from the other funding agencies thank you all